Putting on my top hat, tying up my white tie, brushing up my tail. Welcome to Hatcast, the podcast about hats. I'm Charles Berman. I'm Carl Bernhardson. And I'm special guest Chris Jejitz. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. For the first time, Hatcast first, we have a guest. That's right. And we're all here to talk about hats. Yes, it, one hat in particular. We wouldn't have a hat cast for people on to talk about anything entirely unrelated to hats. True. We might not necessarily talk about hats. We do want to do book reviews about books that happen to be about hats. Yes. Um, and any sort of hat-related thing. We're going to run out of... I mean, this... Hats and things that have to do with hats. Yes. I don't think we're going to run out of things to do with hats. True. We won't run out of hats either. We looked at that list of hats once, and there are hundreds of them. That's... Uh, it's pretty much a gold mine. Right, and right now we're doing episodes about types of hats. Right. So far we have been. We don't even need to do that necessarily. Let's say we're out of ha- episodes about types of hats. We could do one about this particular hat. Yes. It's history from wearer to wearer. Right. Oh, <laughs> wow, an individual hat, right. Yes. Like, um, like a sti- still life in hat casting. Right. Oh, that would be... I'm looking forward to that. But today... Um, and it's not a surprise because it's in the title, so the listener already knows, we are talking about the boater. Boater. Well, but before we do that, we always talk about the hats we're wearing today. Yes. So today I just wore, uh, you know, on my way to the car and back from the car, a baseball cap with, uh, I think, Shakespeare Festival and some year right. on it that I got at a thrift store uh, just to, you know, keep my Cover head Cover your head, Because yes. it's, it's snowed today. It may be April, but it's still snowing. Chris, what, what hat did you wear today? In my normal workaday world, I actually wasn't wearing a hat. Okay. But today for hat cast, specifically I wore my straw boater, which for the listeners at home that can't see us, has a jaunty uh, navy blue and red uh, striped ribbon around it. Yes, that's a very nice hat band. And as well, I, Does that signify anything in particular? Any The colors of any institution? Or club or... or uh... I'm not... Familiar with any kind of specific uh, affiliation the the, the hat uh, band coloring and striping has. Although I know that when striped ties are worn, especially in uh-huh. Great Britain, United Kingdom, the striping of the ties usually refer to very specific prep schools or military regiments. Right. Right. If you don't, if you're wearing a tie and someone's like, "Oh, you were part of this, that, and the other thing," well, for most Americans, they're like, "I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just right. wearing this because I like the blue and, and right. red stripes." But on the other side of the pond, there's a uh, there's a definite significance to it. Right, right. And if, that, you, if you accidentally wear someone else's tie that you were not in that, it can be pretty big it's faux a little pas. Bit of, yeah. Yes. yeah, I actually uh, the first time I met you, Chris, I committed a tie based faux pas. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if I remember that either, Carl. At, at at a thrift store, I had picked up a tie that I liked. It had little red shields that had the word Veritas on it, and. You pointed out, oh, is that, that's, that's an Ivy League tie. Is that Harvard? Uh, and I had to say, I don't know. I got this at a thrift store and I went and looked it up and it was. So oh, you got a Harvard school tie. I had a Harvard school tie that I picked up at a, at a thrift store and didn't, didn't realize it. So, oh. and um, you know, well, you can and, wear and, that to get ahead. It, it, <laughs> as we, we, we've talked before about lying without speaking. Yes. And hats are good for that. And so are ties. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we could do tie cast. I studied one semester at the University of Sussex, which is not the best university in Britain, but it is one, and I did buy their school tie, and I do have a right to wear it. And it's not just striped. It has little crests on it as well, but it's also a nice-looking tie. Yeah. Uh, And I also... What what are the colors of of their... uh... I believe it's it's mainly a blue tie with white and red stripes on it, I think. Yeah. Well, the hat I wore today is a, I guess you'd say a chocolate brown corduroy fedora, uh, which is... Something you don't see a lot. No, it's it's very specific, right? There was a point, I think, in the 70s when somebody said, let's make everything out of corduroy. I have I have a corduroy vest. I have a corduroy shirt. All that I've picked up at thrift stores. A, a whole three-piece corduroy suit. I don't think you could really yeah. get away with wearing that in any kind of... It would have cost you and stop you. No, accosting you and stopping you for wearing something, though, definitely fits in with our topic today. It does. That is true. That so is true. that'll be, there's a little teaser for what's coming up. Yeah, some surety laws would not uh, <laughs> come into effect. Yeah, I think almost any item of clothing it is, you can find it in corduroy. I, yeah. I have a corduroy tie 
uh, somewhere. Oh, wow, that sounds yeah. difficult to tie. It's not too bad. It's a fine corduroy. So. Huh. But this is, I, I do enjoy it. It's not a bad looking hat. It's just No, it, it, does, yeah. it does look good. Yeah. It looks warm. It's perfect for a yep. cold spring day. Which today is. Well, let's get to our hat of the day, which is the straw boater, which has many associations and is a hat that I respect greatly. But unlike the two of you, I don't own one. I was given one by a friend who said, this is just the kind of hat that you would need to have. This is the perfect kind of hat for you. And I said, thank you very politely. And I got tried to put it on my head and it didn't quite fit, but uh-huh. I pretended it fit enough to take the gift. But I eventually had to get rid of it because it really was too small to wear uh-huh. practically. What a shame. Yeah. So Chris, do you, have you, what, what, what have you brought to Hatcast about this redoubtable hat? Well, uh, a couple things. We can talk about some of the associations of, of the yeah. of the of the boater. One of the reasons why I I've, I've actually worn it in the wild to quote one of the uh. Uh, the lines from previous <laughs> headcasts. Uh, in fact, one of the times I've worn it in the wild is to uh, political events. Uh-huh. Uh, specifically, I wore it to an election night victory party for a friend of mine who uh, won a, uh, a political office a couple of years ago. Um, the the boater has an association with politics. I think the most visible way people see it nowadays is at like the presidential political conventions that we see every uh-huh. four years, right? Where you'll see people not usually in nice real straw boaters, right? But using like the flimsy styrofoam, right? With like some red, white, and blue striping, and like usually a lot of like ugly pins uh-huh. uh, on the on the on the on the hat band and things like that. But there's definitely been some political associations mm-hmm. uh, yeah. with the boater. I looked up a couple of references before you came, and this is well, exactly what you're saying is mentioned here in this book, Hats and Headwear Around the World by Beverly Chico. And she says, Early in the 20th century, the straw boater was seen at many political conventions, as it was the staple summer hat for countless American men. The tradition of wearing one's collegiate hues on the boater hat band carried into the political arena with hat band design using the patriotic colors of red, white, and blue. Political candidates often wore and gave away boaters to publicize their campaign slogans, a practice that continued for numerous decades. By the 1980s, the straw political boater was replaced by a realistic straw-look styrofoam or plastic (laughs) version. Novelty hat manufacturers such as Robin Industries of Scranton, Pennsylvania, (laughs) capitalized on this. I like how they mentioned the, the manufacturer of the fake boaters. Uh. capitalized on this seasonal election market by selling thousands of these to campaigns and political organizations. Huh. You know, and that's that's what motivated me to buy my, my boater initially. Uh, I was running for a student government position uh-huh. in college. Yeah. Uh, so it, there we, we mixed the politics and the collegiate uh, oh, yeah, that's meanings true. That of, the, of the boater. Um, and I bought that to wear as I went around campaigning. Uh, oh, that's for perfect. This, this... That says campaign. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, I guess it stood out. I won. So, but... Uh... It's especially entertaining, to, to Charles, from what you, what you mentioned from that one source, the idea that, you know, while well, nowadays political candidates give out pens or bumper stickers or little palm cards with information, uh-huh. back in the day they were giving out <laughs> Straw nice boaters with, yeah. with, with their logos or their uh, some of their campaign slogans. I I would be much more likely to be one. Now I would hope I would decide my vote based on the political questions and my opinions about them. And I not who gave you a hat. <laughs> However, well, if, if you look, if if we want to also a, a random historical reference, uh, one of the claims in I think it was the eighteen forty presidential election is there there were a- allegations that the reason people voted for. Uh, wig candidate William Henry Harrison was because his wig campaign manager was giving out a lot of hard cider to the voters. Uh-huh. <laughs> the log cabin and hard cider campaign. So, if you if the idea that someone might give away their vote for a hat, probably no yeah, less they, or no they more. Could be yeah, uh, I, I I was gonna say I would be if I was gonna decide my vote like, and that does give a new meaning when people talk about which candidate they would rather have beer with, right? <laughs> But I, if, if my vote was going to be swayed by when they're giving things away, I would be more likely to be sweared, swayed by a nice hat than a cheap pen. Yes. I think. It's a better... Yes. Now, this book it finishes by, by saying, however, in the 21st century, voters as a mode for political advertising have been eschewed in favor of other promotional material. Today, they're primarily worn only as costumes in theatrical productions or by comedians. Now, Do, I, I don't know how many comedians are going around. I, Although, when was this book written? That's the thing. It's uh, It says this is the 21st century. Let's see. Here. Well, that's... 
Oh, that's true. 2013. This is a pretty recent book. Okay. Well, that's... I, I guess maybe some comedians were straw boaters. I don't think I, if you I, go not... to your average comedy club or stand-up <laughs> performance... Ah, my <laughs> name's Comedy Joe, and I'm wearing my boater. You know, it's... That <laughs> shows that I'm a comedian. Listen to my jokes. I don't think that's... I think... I wear a funny hat. I'm a funny guy. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I, I think many... Take my hat, please. Huh. Comedians in the past wore them. Yes. <laughs> But I don't. I don't think they're a sign of comedy on, on their own. Now to circle back to the political thing, a uh, common phrase is "throw your hat in the ring" to say that you're going to be running. Does that have any connection to the boater, or um, it's a hat-related question? So we can bring it up here, whether whether it's boater-related or not. But I wonder if it has to do with throwing hats around to all of your potential voters. Well, according to this, uh, an article from Epic Times. The throw your hat expression dates from at least the early 19th century. The earliest citation of it is from an 1805 issue of the Sporting Magazine. Okay, so that would put it before the era of yeah. the voter. Bletcher appeared confident of success in a boxing match and threw his hat into the ring as an act of defiance to his antagonist. Okay, so it's a boxing thing. Yes. That citation doesn't specifically refer to a challenge. Another reference from just a few years later supplies that. The Mirror of Taste, published in Philadelphia in 1810. A young fellow threw his hat into the ring and followed when the lame umpire called out a challenge and proceeded to equip the challenger for the game. He then walked around the ring till a second hat was thrown in and the umpire called out, the challenge is answered. Okay, so not political. I thought that maybe I'd struck on something clever. Well, but... it's it's an interesting story anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think most hat-related idioms and expressions we should eventually get to the etymology of on this program. I think that if we had an episode where we just one after another rapid fire do hat idioms because there are dozens of them, that could be kind of fun. Yeah, it would. Yeah, or we can get to them as we go, or, or we should do one with many of them, and we can revisit them. But th this is very interesting, and it, it speaks to a not a word, but a cultural sign that throwing a hat into a boxing ring indicated a boxing challenge that I don't think we have anymore. Mm -hmm. But to get back to the topic at hand. The boater. You know what we didn't do? We always describe what a boater looks like. Yes. Uh, or what the hat that at hand. And I always think, just subjectively, when I see a boater on someone, this isn't really a criticism of the boater, it kind of looks too flat or squat to contain the amount of head that it does. Right. Because it, it is a very flat, round hat. It has It's a hard straw hat. Uh, it usually uh, has a blunt crown. Yes. Um, which, if you look at one, like you said, in a picture, it doesn't look that tall. It's actually probably a good three and a half, four inches tall. But the way that you wear it on your head, it makes it look much, much, much thinner than it is. I think that the habit of wearing a ribbon uh, around the band definitely contributes to that look. Yeah. Um, but... This was... It... Now, there are many associations to the boater because it was the default hat during summer for many years. Right. So you, it's, it gained an association with anything you would do in the summer, like oh, boating. And people say it's a formal hat, but it really was worn in formal and informal situations. It's kind of like a bowler. By all, so yeah, by all it was like social the classes. summer bowler. Yeah. So do you think, have you seen, the, you, you must, you, of course you've seen them in the wild. You've worn it in the wild. I've worn it in the wild. I've seen them in the wild. I've seen Chris wear his so in the wild. So you think this is a more ubiquitous hat these days than the bowler is? I think that because of the summer association... And the, you know, the various school and uh, sporting associations that it's picked up, you still see it worn unironically by people at events. I think it has held up a little bit better than the boater, even though it is just as old timey looking when you put it on. More people have occasions to wear it because of summer events. I think one classic example would be the Kentucky Derby, which occurs... Uh, every first Saturday in May. Oh, yes. Um, that's uh, a sporting event where everybody, male and female, put on their best hats. Right. Uh, there's actually a historical reason for that. They, a lot of those traditions of the Kentucky Derby were borrowed from English horse racing. In England, at the English races that they borrowed some of the Kentucky Derby traditions from, the best and most important socially were be guests in the Royal Box. And those who were guests in the Royal Box were required to wear hats. So they took that... And then, then, of course, everyone wanted to wear a hat as well because everyone wanted to be assumed to be a guest in the royal box. Right. So now everybody at the race was wearing, wearing hats. So thus, that tradition was carried over to America. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still... 
and enforce a lot of the famous horse races we have probably most prominently at the Kentucky Derby. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I know I've seen gentlemen at the Kentucky Derby walking around with their summer boaters. Many of them, if they're very fashionable, will try to have their hat band match either a tie oh, or their, yeah. their, 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 their suit jacket. There's going to be something like, oh, I'm wearing a light blue uh, blazer, so I'm going to have a light blue uh, hat band. So they they try to be fashionable with, with how they coordinate and accessorize. Yeah. Actually, it would now be a good time to sort of get into a little bit of the history of yes. the voter. This book here, Fashion and Merchandising Fads, by Frank Hoffman and Bela B. Ramirez, says, The straw boater, flat as a saucer and shellacked to a board-hard stiffness, was in vogue from 1870 when machines capable of sewing straw were invented until 1926 when Blackwood's magazine administered the symbolic death knell, referring to it as that horrible and obsolete form of headgear. (laughs) The The hat reached its peak of popularity between 1880 and 1900. During that time, the boater eclipsed all other forms of male headgear, including business wardrobes. The straw boater was best known, however, as the ultimate leisure hat, as the working class acquired sufficient leisure time in the late 19th century by our mechanization to discover the simple pleasures of boating, tennis, and lounging at sidewalk cafes. The inexpensive machine-made boaters came to symbolize their newfound emancipation. That is true. I, I hadn't thought about that, but it must have been. I mean, if they were giving it away at rallies, it must not have been that expensive to make, because it is straw, which is a uh, cheap material, cheaper than felt. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, it is woven by machine, so which I hadn't been sure of. I wasn't sure if it was machine woven or. But uh, well, this would be hard to make in in 1860. Right before you had that technology. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't have that, see the hat popped up continuously in magazine illustrations and impressionist paintings of the common man at play. The popularity of boaters owed as much to their evocation of supreme likeness. They floated rather than fitting snugly on the head, as to their low cost. In addition, one of the era's most charismatic entertainers, Maurice Chevalier made the hat his own. Its light-hearted appearance, combined with his unshakably sunny disposition, proved to be the perfect match. That is true, and it does sort of sit on the head. It's almost like a straw version of the Buster Keaton hat, yeah. in, 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 but it's it not quite that exaggerated. But. Now, now, my boater, which is from uh, 1903, has a mesh in it that it looks like was meant to keep the head from... Sort of oh. bumping into the straw itself, allowing for more circulation, which oh. makes sense with it being a summer hat to yeah. keep you warmer. Yeah, Chris's more recent one has sort of a uh, leather band, sort of kind of a lining. In yeah, there. but I can see there's also it's got some the way it's stitched in gives it some give. So in theory, my head should not be banging directly against the right. straw. And right. between the straw being a little bit porous and that space between your head and the netting or band, it does give quite a lot of airflow. And this mine has actually what I think is a very thin leather. Uh, yeah, that looks leather to me. Yeah, leather band. Leather band that was that connected to that netting and then the netting connected to what looks like a silk or faux silk lining. Uh, and oh, and the best part about my 1903 straw boater is that it uh, is the little inscription inside which says that it's the celebrated Baltimore hat. That's all you need to know about a hat. Which I think is a great slogan. I think I should use that for just about anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all you need to know. That's it. That's it. You know, you, you have this one. You know, you know about it. It's like, this is the celebrated hat cast. That's, <laughs> that's all, all you need, need to, to know. know about a podcast. <laughs> Once the boater slipped out of fashion, its playful character seemed out of place during the Depression and World War II. Not to mention the frenetic pace of the post-war era. Nothing could revive it. The hat was relegated to the status of a costume piece. Worn by Venetian gondoliers, the Princeton Marching Band, various college alumni classes at reunions, and the like. <laughs> it's very specific examples of yeah. people Although, who wear this hat. They do. They do pretty. It does a very good job of illustrating the kind of people who you would yes, still find wearing boaters today. Not just <laughs> old-fashioned people. One other group that uh, I think sort of is contemporaneously associated with the straw boater are barbershop quartets. Right. Yes. And that I think you you often and I think if you see pump someone wearing one today that'll be one of your first associations, the barbershop quartet. So now this book suggested that the boater was becoming unfashionable by the end of the nineteen twenties. Yeah, this is this is the American Hatter magazine from nineteen twenty one, mm-hmm. talking about how in the middle of June one of the leading London manufacturers, realizing the situation, conceived the idea 
a joint advertising campaign to repopularize the straw boater as a season ad. So it, it was, I think, fading from popularity by the 20s. But I've seen many 20s films where people, people are still wearing them all yeah. over all the time. But it is very a, a, a solidly turn-of-the-century hat. Or that's where it was at its peak. Although, one of the most famous straw boater-related incidents happened in the 20s. But it does sort of speak to its waning popularity. And that's the uh, straw... Straw hat riot. riot. Yes. Should we read the, the blurb about this on Wikipedia that it explains? I think so. Oh, I guess first some background information. Uh, there was a day called Straw Hat Day in most cities, which was the unofficial end of, or beginning of, and end of summer. It was, depending on where you were, Straw Hat Day could mean either one. It was either Straw Hat Day or Felt Hat Day. Sometimes it was Straw Hat Day in both instances. But it was when you switched from your felt hat to your straw hat. And it was usually at some point in September. Uh, and it varied from city to city based on climate. And if you were found wearing a straw hat after the day that it was no longer appropriate to wear a straw hat, you might be accosted by a gang of young people who would knock your hat off your head and smash it. Which sounds kind of frightening, right? Uh, and a little bit extreme. And apparently not everybody always liked this. And sometimes people fought back. Yeah, it says here the... It, the cold weather counterpart was Felt Hat Day, occurring in September or October. Mm -hmm. And, the, of course, in the 1920s, the standard, most common kind of felt hat would probably be the bowler. your bowler. Yep. Uh, or maybe a soft felt hat, but probably a bowler and your most common kind of straw hat right. would be your boater. And then it says here, uh, the practice of wearing formal hats largely disappeared by the mid-1900s. However, as late as 1963, Straw and Felt Hat Day were commemorated in an editorial in the New York Times. So it was at least remembered for a yes, while. Yeah. In some cities, the convention was forcefully observed by young men who would seize and destroy any straw hat worn after the appointed day. On a number of stock exchange floors, traders wore straw hats with the deliberate intention of getting them destroyed. <laughs> Confusingly, the term Straw Hat Day was used in that era to refer both to the day of their adoption at the beginning of the summer and their destruction at the end. In 1922, in New York City, the tradition escalated into the Straw Hat Riot, which lasted eight days involving a mob of 1,000 young hat destroyers at its peak and resulted in a number of arrests and injuries. I just, the most amazing point there is eight days. Eight days of rioting over straw hats seems... Wonderful. On, one, one, well, I don't know. Wonderful. It got pretty, <laughs> got pretty violent. People got hurt. Some people were hospitalized. No, I, I don't really. I yeah. don't encourage. I don't think you should. And I'm going to say you should not go to cost people for their hats. No, wear whatever hat you want. That's what. That's kind of what this is all about, right? Um, the hat cash is definitely a pro hat. Right. Pro, yeah, we're against destroying other people's hats. Yeah. <laughs> we want hats to flourish and prosper. Yeah, if you see someone wearing a hat that you don't like... Don't knock it from their head and destroy no, it. No, it just sort of think to yourself, oh, what a shocking bad hat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which we'll have, to get, we'll have to get to that story yeah. in a future program. Um, but yeah, so how, how did it go on for so long? Do we have any more information about this straw hat riot? So it started on September 13th of 1922, which was before the supposed date when you weren't meant to wear your hat. So these were people going sort of and jumping the gun and destroying hats before it was even time. And it, I think that what happened was there was a group of dock workers who were wearing hats and they were accosted by teenagers and college kids uh, and the dock workers being a little bit stronger and more surly uh, fought back and these fights just continued to erupt throughout the city for days and days and days. Uh, it, there were gangs of teenagers that prowled the streets with sticks and apparently some of them even took nails and drove them through the end of sticks. This is this, this goes beyond like, oh, I hit you with a stick and knocked your hat off. This is now, I am trying to seriously injure you. Bodily because, harm. Because of your hat. Um, yeah, I think there are cases when riots start for whatever reason, and people get just caught up in the violence and become blindly violent sometimes. Right. This and then, is a, just part of human nature, unfortunately, that this can happen. Right. And then, you know, I'm sure that there were people who just then put a straw hat on and go out because they were looking for a fight. You know, that's the... I, I could definitely see someone doing that. Yeah, like, I can see Come on, fight me, knock my hat off, kid. Yeah. You could today, I'm sure, find something to wear that would cause people right, to be they're... upset at you and <laughs> start fights with you in the street. It would not be a boater hat. No. I, as, as an avid boater, 
Uh, I am thinking about picking up a hat that isn't antique that I can wear Ooh. while boating. I think that'll be fun. So yeah, and I personally would like a boater hat just because I I like the the hat, and it is there. There really aren't many other options if you want something from that evocative of that era that you can wear during the summer months. Right. Uh, I guess the next closest thing would be like a seersucker jacket. Well, I meant on my head. Oh, right. I mean, I could <laughs> hang the jacket over my head. That's that's true. It would it would at least keep the sun off. This is not jacket worn on head cast. No, it's hat cast. <laughs> We were speaking about the declining fashionability of the straw boater. One of the interesting things is in the 1930s, uh-huh. the straw boater became associated as part of an unofficial part of the FBI wardrobe. Really? really? Yes, which would, I guess, if you're trying to be fashionable, you do not want to look like members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Right. Right. The, the FBI has kind of always had a reputation for wearing... The last generation's fashionable clothing. Yes. Right? Like in, in the... As you were getting into the 70s and things like that, they were still wearing the black suit and the, the pencil tie and things like that. Correct. Very this interesting. This is not a good way to go undercover. No, I don't no. think they were trying to go undercover. I think they were well, trying to say, just... here here come the G-Men. Correct. You know? uh, one of the classic examples that uh, listeners may be familiar with is the 1970s movie The Sting, starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford. In there, there is a set of characters that are the FBI agents as part of the story. They are all wearing straw boaters, and they show up a couple times very ominously, and it's always like, uh-oh, here come the feds wearing their straw boaters. Huh. Right. And I, I think that, I remember that at the time that the, uh, the movie was praised for its appropriate adherence to... Uh, the the styles of the time, which I think was set in the early 1930s during the mm, Depression. Right. So the, the, I know the, the wardrobing was supposed to be uh, very well done. Huh. Yeah, because by that point, sort of your summer hat would have been... Uh, it would still be straw hats, but they were made to look like the felt hats of the day, right? You'd Probably have, more like a Panama hat. Like a Panama hat. hat, which kind of looks like a fedora just made out of yeah. like a thinner straw. Yeah. Which is what I typically wear in the summer is a... Straw Panama hat. Yeah, and I usually get one that's. They're usually pretty expiring. Yes, they don't. They don't really last the whole season. These they, boaters they last hard. pretty well. That one's from 1901. You said 1903. Yeah, 1903. and it's well. You know why? Because it's been shellacked. Yeah. Uh, they've they've ground up little bugs and they've mixed them with water and they've painted them all over the straw and that has really done a great job of uh, keeping this hat intact for 115 years. Yeah. I remember seeing an episode of Jack Benny, the Jack Benny program from the 1950s, where they're flashing back to Jack courting Mary Livingston when she was working at the May Company, and I guess what would have been the night. 19- is this the one where he had the, the hat and he tossed it and then came back almost like a Yeah, like Yes, you've seen this one too. <laughs> I have, yes. <laughs> and, well, they're using that boater hat to evoke. It's the 1910s or 20s. Yeah. It's when Jack Benny was young. Right, which, is that accurate? Would he, wouldn't he have been young a little bit later than that? Yes. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the running gags in the Jack Benny program was he was a very old person pretending <laughs> yes. to be always thirty nine. He, he was th- every year they would have Jack Benny's thirty ninth birthday episode. <laughs> I think there was like a, one of the skets they had one time was he was very pleased that his alleged hometown of uh, Waukegan, Illinois, destroyed his birth certificate, <laughs> so no one in the future could verify when he really was born. Yeah, and his uh, he. Keeps his money in, in, in a vault in the basement, and the guy guarding the vault is always surprised that the Civil War is not still happening. <laughs> you know, we mentioned Maurice Chevalier yes. earlier and his association with the straw boater. One of the interesting things is, is how uh, he helped determine some of the styling of how the boater was worn. One of the things when the boater was fashionable was the angle at which you wore it. How far uh, over the eye, angle. what kind of yeah. angle over the ear. That was the big fashion for the, the, the young, hip crowd at the time. Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, there was a joke I heard a while ago, uh, and it had to do with what jaunty angle you wore ha- your hat at. I, I know that's probably the least uh, entertaining way to describe a joke, but yes, it involved hats and how they were worn at jaunty angles. So I, I am familiar with, the, with the, the wearing of hats at different angles, and I think that's probably still something with the youth today. Wearing your True. hat. Baseball caps are worn. You know, there were times where it was sideways backwards, or backwards. Or, sideways. Yeah. 
front ways. I, I think an angled hat still suggests jauntiness. Yeah. yeah. Sort of says, I'm, you know, I'm young and hip and here to have fun. It does, uh, and even if you're not young, it shows uh, a, a devil may care. Certain joie de vie. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, to further separate us from any young people. Young people have the vie. young demographic, the, the, the millennials out there, you're using words like joie de vivre and jaunty all the time. <laughs> well, what's the young people way of saying that? Uh, cool, right? Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. You wear your hat in a cool way. Um, <laughs> well, you could say that too. Yeah. Um, so it says that at the time it would have been called mainly just a straw hat because it hadn't been foregrounded by other very popular straw hats. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you'd just be wearing your straw hat. Yeah. When did it start being called the boater? Well, I think it was it was called that even back okay. when it was popular. We had that article from the twenties, even. And That's they true. mainly just would have called it a straw hat. Uh, it's and it says this at hatbox dot com. They're saying that it was called a boater in reference to the gondoliers in Venice wearing them. Oh, okay. But I think you could easily wear it on a boat, and many people did. And it says it may also be referred to as a skimmer, a katie, a katie, a basher, a sommer, a senate hat, and a can can hat. To name a few. I've never heard any of those. I've no. heard boater or just straw, straw hat. hat. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's fun that it had a lot of different names that yeah. didn't quite make it. Well, how would you rate a boater hat? We usually rate it on style and practicality. Yeah, we'll let you go first, Chris. We'll start okay. with... Um, we start with style and then move to practicality. I don't think, think we, we can. I don't think we have an order. I think we switch yeah. back and forth. Yeah. So. Am I reading this like on a scale of 1 to 10? Scale of exactly 1 to 10. Well, yeah. So, if I'm going to do this on style first... Um, I would definitely give this a solid eight or an eight and a half on a style category, especially if you consider the fact that the hat band can be color coordinated with the right, rest of your yes. outfit. So it's successful whether it coordinates with a tie, like I've often done, or coordinate with a with a blazer or a jacket, or you know if you're gonna uh, highlight some sort of a school or regimental affiliation as they've yeah. done in the past. I would give that a. A solid eight, eight and a half. All right. What about you, Carl? I'm going to go with uh, eight and a half as well because it is still a stylish hat. I could wear this today and people would say, oh, he's a little bit old fashioned and weird. But, but it looks good and yeah. jaunty and fun. Yeah, and they're yeah. already saying that, so I might as well wear the boater. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And all of the coordination things, it's it's a blank canvas, really, yeah. because you can wear it with anything. I could wear it with... so many associations, it doesn't block out any. You right. Really... And you you even see um, in paintings from the day, you see people wearing a boater with uh, like an undershirt while they're, you know, at the beach or with a full, full suit, suit. Yeah. During the, you know, at a business meeting at, outside. Um, yeah, so I, I have to I have to give it an 8.5. And what about practicality? <laughs> uh, as far as practicality goes, I mean, being straw for the summer... Uh, for the lightness and the fact that with the with the with the stiff rim, it'll keep the sun out of your eyes and give you a little coverage, so you're not getting a complete sunburn. I also I would give these a high mark for this hat on uh, practicality as well, given seasonalness. Given mm-hmm. that's the important predicate there. So, but I would give this a sim. I'm going to give this a solid eight point five on practicality as well. Probably the one thing I would say is in contrast to a Panama hat, the brim is not. That big, right? So in yeah. theory, if you're if, if one of the things you're looking for is protection from the sun, sun there might be better hats. So I'm not gonna give it a perfect ten, but I think a solid eight and a half. And what about you, Carl? I'm gonna give it a seven point five on practicality because there are more practical and I'd say equally stylish summer hats that you can wear. It does lack the crushability of yeah. a nonchalant straw hat. Uh, the brim isn't that big it's not floppy in a way that you can sort of position it uh best to keep the sun out 7.5 i still think is very good score for practicality Uh, this is going to get high marks overall um but yeah this uh and it's the the shellacking makes it just a little bit brittle and that's the you do have to baby it a little bit and maybe it's just because mine is 115 years old that i feel this about Uh, it i think if i had a newer one maybe i i might have i might be instinctively giving it a higher score um, but I do think overall it's very practical. Before I give my rating, I want to ask you a question as people who wear them. How, my main problem with straw hats is always the rain. Right. How does it do in the rain with the shellacking? Does that help? I think the shellac is done specifically to keep it from l- losing its shape in the rain. Yeah. I think that it would be... I don't know. Have you worn yours in the rain, Chris? I never have worn mine in the rain. I mean, again, I only wear this for sort of special occasions when I'm... Right. Yeah, but it, it, might, it might start raining. I'm going to yeah. agree with Carl. 
Because I, I wouldn't go out in the rain with a straw hat. No, I would not either. Overall, from our ratings, it got an 8.125, which is very good. That's very yeah. good. What a, what a good score. Three decimals. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a very good, uh, very good summary of the straw hat. I the, think so. The boater hat, I should say. If uh, you, the listener, have any comments about this episode, the boater, anything we've ever said, really, or you just want to send us a picture of you in a hat, or a picture of a hat, or a picture of a hat in a hat, um, or a hat on a hat, hat on a hat, yeah, um, do it, uh, and you can send that to hatcast at yandex dot com. H a t c a s t at y a n d e x. Dot C-O-M. All right. I think that's it. I'd like to thank Chris for joining us today. Carl and Charles, I want to thank you guys for inviting Very me on to be good a to third, have third co-host for this week's cat hat, wonderful, hat cast. Wonderful. This week's hat cast. Wonderful contributions to the program. We were very glad to have you. We hope everyone enjoyed the program and that if you liked it, you derived joy from things you liked and your life was improved. Yes. Well, we're talking about 1920s fashion and some of the goings in and out of the fashionability of the, of the straw boater. I do want to give a shout to my friend Liz, um, who may be listening, uh, who is a fan of 1920s fashion. Oh, yeah. Hi, Hi. Liz. Hi. And on that note, bye. Bye. Start of the summer, a guy bought a boater to wear to all of the games so he'd be smartened in fashion. When flashing a smile at the lady in white And at the last game of summer Last moments of play He'd toss it up in the air Yes, he'd throw it away There'd be hundreds of hats And I've never forgotten the sight Hundreds of hats Thousands of hats have come sailing